flashing light, it's not on. What's that? It's flash, flashing on my system. Yeah, okay. okay. Good, yeah. So I think it's recording. Yeah. Good. So I'm um, also just because people tend to leave microphones off, um, we only presenters have microphone access at the moment, but um, we can give it to people later. But look, we'll probably just get Rick to do a talk uh, and then pull in questions for, through the chat afterwards. So I'm going to switch off now and over to you, Rick. Thanks very much. OK, no worries. Okay, so uh, so my title today is um, who should have um, a voice in research. Um, the that question is something which has been um, a question which I've been interested in throughout my uh, throughout my whole academic career. Um, but obviously, the the context within which uh, it's been deployed has changed over that time, over sort of twenty twenty five years. So if I think back to my um, PhD research, where I was looking at um, science and the media, the way that science was represented, particularly in newspapers and on television, um, that question of how forms of expertise and experience were deployed uh, and reported in uh, news reports uh, was something I was really interested in. It was a question of how that kind of expertise and experience was represented. So it was it was an issue about who did get a voice and who didn't get a voice, and that kind of question of access, I think, is is something which is is of interest to you as well. I hope. Um, but that that kind of issue has kind of changed, obviously, partly there due to the introduction of more interesting forms of digital tools and technologies, uh, which obviously offer different ways to represent expertise and identity, particularly in relation to research. So it's extended the conversation. Is is a kind of reasonable way of kind of summing that up. And and that started in about 97 uh, in the UK, certainly, when uh, newspapers um, and the BBC uh, decided to start uh, introducing websites. Um, so the BBC had tried to do this in 1996, and there was no great interest. In effect, they'd taken, they'd taken the site back down. Uh, but it was put back up for the for the general election in 1997, and it's never gone since. And and obviously, it's grown and grown and grown. Um, and the opportunities to to contribute to those kind of debates ha have also grown and grown and grown as more and more tools and technologies have been introduced uh, and become mainstreamed. So that's that's one aspect of what I'm interested in. But there's there's more than that. Uh, as we go through, I'll explain some of the other um, issues that I'm interested in. But really, that kind of interesting point about the synergies between um, what you call openness and, and I consider to be engagement uh, um, is something I really want to focus on today. And that really starts to come together to me in the early 2000s when people started to publish uh, forms of, of literature uh, that were relevant to the engagement uh, discourse that were open access. Uh, and I'd never seen that before. Um, and it, I'm kind of interested as, as to when that started to uh, come about in your kind of areas of interest. But for me, it was it was really the early 2000s. Um, and as soon as I saw it, I thought, well, this is blindingly obvious. Why am I not doing this? Um, so it, it became something I was doing through my research. It was also something that I was interested in in terms of our teaching. Um, so the book you see on the first slide here is the is is a book that came out in 2009 but the work that went into it really started in about 2006 through 2007 um, and it's it's the foundational text for one of the master's courses in science communication where we were both exploring what openness meant in relation to science communication and science engagement as well as trying some experiments to actually do that kind of work um, so it's a kind of uh, a question of of how openness and engagement were influencing all our academic practices um, in the sciences and beyond. So that's kind of what I thought I'd talk about today. That's that's the kind of focus of today. Um, in terms of the structure for, for the session, um, I've split it into these five sections um, around in-access responsiveness, uh, engaged research design, barriers and enablers, uh, and then, then we'll have some chance for a bit of question at the end of it. Um, so the reason why I've done it like that comes down to um, some work done by our dear uh, Martin Weller, uh, your very own Martin Weller. Um, so 
the, the, the connections between engagement and openness, as I say, is something I've been interested in for a long time, but it really starts to come together um, around that kind of, uh, that course in, in 2009. And since then, my work has changed slightly in that I have a responsibility, or I have done over the last sort of six, seven years for trying to drive change in engagement and openness, as well as obviously researching it and teaching it. Um, and this slide here um, is an example of that, uh, a pr very recent piece of work which I've just finished, uh, drawing on some of the work at Martin's done, but also other people across the, the Open University to explore how uh, practices of openness and engagement uh, connect with our manifesto commitment uh, to the National Coordinating Centre's manifesto for public engagement. So uh, at the top here, we see the little logo for the National Coordinating Centre. It's 10 years old now. Uh, we connected with them uh, 10 years ago in 2008 and have done so since then. Um, but what they asked us to do uh, just in the last few weeks is to refresh our commitment to that manifesto. And really this, this uh, final line here in Martin's quote is the one which I wanted to highlight for today, uh, where he talks about the challenges uh, to the wider education centre to embrace different interpretations of open um, and how they benefit learners and society more broadly. And that's really what I want to talk about today is that challenge um, and how working across kind of ideas of openness engagement, uh, we can actually try to address those kind of challenges. So uh, in terms of the structure itself, it's not just the uh, 10th anniversary of the National Coordinating Centre for Public Engagement. It's also the 40th anniversary of the Open University's Community Computers and Learning Research Group. Um, and they recently held an event at the Open University where um, there was a, a time for reflection, a time for taking stock of what's happening in relation to uh, that kind of work at the Open University and beyond, and also a, a, an opportunity to think forwards and think, okay, what are the challenges and opportunities that we face over the next 10 to 15 years, for example? <clears throat> and you won't be too surprised to know that Martin was called to speak at that event, um, and he talked um, alongside uh, Kate and Eileen about these four points. So how do we make the inaccessible accessible? Uh, how do we make uh, learning better for everyone by learning, addressing the needs of underserved populations? How do we design for diversity? And how do we break down barriers? Um, and to do that, as you can see on the right here, uh, Martin wore a very fine hat uh, to discuss each of those challenges. So what I wanted to do today is to take uh, that uh, very useful kind of way of organizing uh, your thinking around this uh, and to imitate it basically. Uh, so imitation being the highest form of flattery. Um, what I'd like to do is to add a, a slightly different lens uh, to that. So rather than straightforward openness, I'm thinking about engagement. Uh, so obviously the lens changes a bit, the hat changes a bit. Um, this is me wearing my Luton Town hat, my beloved uh, Luton Town Football Club uh, are called the Hatters. So obviously the hat uh, that Martin wore uh, sparked a, a thought in my head that I could copy that, obviously. Um, but what I was thinking of was, was if you take the same challenges uh, that Martin uh, and Eileen and Kate had raised at that event and add a research lens to it in terms of engagement, um, how does that change the way we think about that? And what I've done is I've, I've taken each of those four challenges, uh, added that kind of lens of engaged research, uh, and I'm going to go through them one at a time and try and explore what I think are the, some of the similarities and some of the differences uh, in our thinking around that. So uh, it's pretty obvious if you look at the first one, it's about making ex inaccessible accessible, but very much extending access to research experience. How do we make things better for everyone? Um, by addressing the needs of underserved stakeholders, end users, and members of the public. So a slight difference there. How do we design for diversity by understanding, personalizing, engaged research design? So that's kind of tailoring things for particular populations. Uh, and then the final question is, is a more cultural one, is about breaking down barriers um, to simplistic uh, notions of engagement. So that's how I've organized the talk. Um, so I thought I'd just mention just briefly 
a couple of the things which I think are very important in terms of the similarities. So the, the obvious one at the top, the big one is obviously change. Um, so I've seen a lot of change um, in the way that not just academic practices have changed over the last 20 years since I've been an academic, but also how institutional structures have also changed. Um, and that's an ongoing process, obviously. Um, some of those issues are very live at the minute. Um, some of them have been addressed. But crucially for me, it's about the following dimensions. So it's partly about the proactive and the reactive. So uh, in that sense, um, who's leading the change? Um, so if you have a community of, of very enthusiastic and dedicated early adopters of, of, of particular practices, whether that's openness or engagement, uh, that's a very different thing to trying to mainstream those practices and saying, OK, how people are how people are reacting to those uh, across the piece. Uh, and then the second set of dimensions are represented by the two pictures. Uh, so uh, the one at the bottom um, is uh, a, a piece of the frontispiece of Thomas Hobbes classic philosophical text, La Fiatum, and that represents the kind of command and control top down approach to change. Uh, so that's change imposed from above. Um, and the second image there is uh, the cover of the Buzzcock single, uh, which includes the track autonomy. Um, so that represents academic freedom. So those dimensions, I think, are incredibly important to keep in mind, um, both if you're trying to uh, understand change, but also if you're trying to lead change within an organization. Um, and they obviously are very dynamic uh, within a situation. So in terms of my role within that, it's about trying to think of, of ways that we can push progressive approaches to engagement uh, and engage research uh, in ways that benefit research, uh, but also that benefit the people who are engaging with that research, either as stakeholders and users or members of the public. So that's that's kind of what I'm trying to do through my work. OK, so that's a very kind of brief overview uh, of uh, why I've done things the way I have. Um, section two starts to build on the different questions and issues that were raised originally by Martin and Eileen and Kate uh, and that I've added my lens to in terms of the engaged research approach. So section two, very much about making the inaccessible accessible, uh, extending access to the research experience. So um, if you think about why we should do that uh, is a kind of key question. So why should we try and extend uh, access um, is an important question to ask. So a couple of years ago, I, I went down to New Zealand and I was very lucky to meet some uh, some great researchers down there who introduced me to this book by Miranda Fricker um, around the concept of epistemic injustice. Uh, and I found this very powerful kind of idea, particularly in relation to what I was trying to do to tr drive aggressive change in this area. And uh, Fricker talks about uh, epistemic justice being a, a distinctively a distinctive type of injustice uh, in which someone is wronged specifically in their capacity as a knower. Um, and that to me was very powerful in terms of uh, issues around um, in access to, to, to knowledge, basically, and in access to be able to shape and frame the way that knowledge is both produced, but also the way that the impacts of knowledge influence society, um, either economically or socially. Anyway, she, she then goes on to talk about two specific types of injustice, uh, testimonial injustice. So she took a question about who is denied a voice in knowing uh, and hermeneutical injustice. So what factors reinforce that exclusion. Um, and that, to me, was a very powerful idea, particularly if you then try and turn it around the other way and say, OK, how might we promote epistemic justice? Um, and whether engagement uh, and openness by, by implication can have a role in promoting epistemic justice. So uh, here's a couple of papers here, one of which I wrote myself and one of which was written by a, a colleague in New Zealand who introduced me to Miranda Fricker's work, uh, Fabian McBecky. Um, 
and particularly uh, Fabian's work, he focuses in this paper, the links are at the bottom of the page here if you want to have a look yourself, uh, he focuses in that paper on questions of testimonial injustice. Uh, so that you can ask questions about who should have a voice in uh, research, particularly how are those voices heard, um, and then he also introduces this question about how you might reduce credibility excess. So in effect, credibility, ex credibility excess is when you have uh, experts dominating the agenda to the exclusion of other voices. So the question is then, obviously, who should have that voice in research? Um, and how do you ensure that, the, that people are given reasonable and fair opportunities to have that voice in research? So that's one aspect of it. And the second aspect of it is uh, around this concept of hermeneutical injustice. Um, so I see, if, see that from two sides of the, of, the, of the challenge, one of which is, uh, are we as researchers prepared to engage? Um, and I, I see that both as a kind of philosophical preparation, but also a very practical preparation. Um, so do we want to engage? But also then do we know how we, we should engage? Uh, and then crucially, um, how publics do or do not have any full opportunities to genuinely engage, which are fair and equitable. So those two obviously work together in kind of reflexive tension um, in that um, if, if researchers are not engaging in a meaningful way, then how do they know whether publics have any meaningful opportunities to engage and so on and so forth? It becomes, it becomes a question of, of offering opportunities, genuine opportunities to understand different perspectives uh, within a research debate. Okay, so that's the kind of, um, that's the theory behind some of the issues um, I'm going to discuss. Um, I thought I'd offer you a, a practical example just to, to illustrate the point. So um, this is a, a, a little case study um, that was produced uh, by uh, a group of students at a local school uh, that I was working with uh, with researchers across the university, uh, but also with teachers obviously at the school um, and with a, a designer who helped us do this work. Uh, and what we were trying to do was to explore with the students uh, what capacities they needed to build to be able to engage. Uh, so assuming that they didn't have all the uh, skills and competencies they might need to engage before they started. Um, obviously what we needed to do as researchers to work effectively with them and to work effectively in, in a classroom environment but crucially what we wanted to do is we wanted to explore how we might be able to uh, share the representation of the different contributions in the project so we started from the, the premise that everyone should have a voice in this research therefore how should we represent those different voices and those different contributions in ways that were meaningful to those who are participating. Um, so I say this was part of a, a bigger project, um, a bigger project that had been funded by RCUK, that was Research Councils UK, as was at the time, they're now called uh, UK Research and Innovation, but effectively uh, they funded this piece of work to work in partnership. So the researchers at the European University will work in partnership with local schools. Um, and we developed this little typology of activities to, to try and have a sort of flexible and adaptable framework so that the young people and the teachers could buy into activities that they thought were useful uh, and obviously help to co-design them with us. Um, um, this activity that I'm talking now is, is one of those activities under the creativity uh, block. But our underpinning principle, which was the kind of place where we started from, was that children and young people uh, are a pool of talent uh, from which the next generation of expertise will develop. In effect, they're citizens. They may not have all the same skills and capacities as an adult, uh, but are there ways that we can work with them um, to give them that opportunity? Uh, so we saw them as prospective citizens with a stake in how research agendas are framed and prioritised. Uh, we also saw them as having some responsibility, uh, particularly as they got older, for managing the benefits and challenges that arise from the social and ec economic impact of those studies. So what we were trying to do is to, to give them opportunities to become engaged citizens in the way that we hoped that we were also becoming engaged citizens. Um, so that was the kind of the underpinning philosophy of what we were trying to do. 
Now, when it came to actually thinking about how we might organize this activity, I'd done some work previously um, through a Nesta funded project uh, with people like Trevor and, uh, and there's a guy called Peter Devine who also worked on this activity. He'd worked on this project isotope with me and Trevor. Um, and what we were trying to do through this project that you see on the screen here was to build a community website that would be uh, co-produced and co-maintained with a community of science communication practitioners. That was that was the underpinning philosophy. Uh, and we were faced with a similar challenge was how would we represent contributions to this project? So we worked with the community and members of the community to develop the, the website through a kind of needs analysis and, and testing the, the, the website as we went along. And our solution to that was to try and find uh, some way of representing them. Um, and we came up with this idea of, of, of adapting the periodic table, basically. Um, and as you can see, the, the little elements on the periodic table, which uh, don't show up terrifically well on this, but if you click on the link and go to the back page of the project, you'll see it more clearly uh, that each of the elements in inverted commas that you see in this diagram uh, were contributors, contributors to the project. So that allowed us to, to do some kind of shared representation of the project as a whole. Um, so what we did was we took this into the school when we wanted to do this new project um, and said to, this, to the young people, does this look like a good idea? I had this notion in my head that we might build a, a, a sort of um, a hexagon structure like a hive um, and each of the cells in the hive would represent one individual who contributed to the project and if we clicked on them then they could record uh, different activities that they contributed to the project so that to me made sense uh, but of course when we went to the school the, the, the young people looked at it and said no that's just too complicated and we're not going to do it we don't have time uh, there's no payback for us to do that so i said fine okay that's perfectly reasonable we've given you the opportunity to design your own way of representing your contributions to the project. Um, let's see what they look like. So um, what we did was we did this little design activity. Uh, we worked with a small number of students, um, a couple of researchers of one, one of them was myself, one of them was Trev Collins, a guy called Peter Devine, who's a, a graphic designer and a teacher from the school. And we did this little participatory design activity. And what we wanted to do is to, to come up with some way of representing different contributions to the project. Uh, so it was a co-design of some kind of artifact. We didn't know what it was going to look like when we started. Um, in the end, what happened was over a period of, of, of about 12 months, the students design, decided, uh, having thought through uh, different attributes that they would like to see in researchers, uh, they, they came up with this idea of representing those attributes on a wristband. Um, um, and that was something that they valued. So what we did is we, we, we went through the whole process, agreed the whole design with them. Um, they led that design process. Um, and if you want to use any of the resources and stuff, there's a link there to the, the best practice case study. So what they came up with, as I say, was this uh, wristband that we could give out both to researchers who were working on the project, but also uh, to the children, young people, and the teachers who were involved in the project as well. And the four attributes that they particularly wanted to see uh, in researchers who were coming in to work with them were creativity, uh, inquisitiveness, um, imagination, and positivity. Um, and that found, I found that very useful to actually go when you try and negotiate with a, with a researcher um, a new activity is to give them that and say, don't pull off the, the lecture you've done to every group of students over the last 20 years um, and just dust that down and pull it out again. Actually really think carefully about the type of things that actually the students might need to know, the teachers might te need to know, and the ways that will actually be valued, valuable to them in how they work with you. It doesn't sound like rocket science, but uh, it's surprising how uh, people become stuck in their old ways of practicing uh, engagement. Okay, so that's a little example uh, of um, of the principles of trying to um, work beyond uh, our standard ways of working, if you like, uh, and to try and think about how we make uh, the inaccessible accessible. Okay, so 
the second uh, um, principle issue to look at is how do we make things better for everyone? How do we address the needs of underserved populations? Um, and that, I say, is a huge issue in the engagement literature. Uh, it sounds like it's a big issue in um, the openness literature as well. So, f first and foremost, uh, I'm very cautious about just deploying engagement for the sake of deploying engagement. So uh, what I always try to do with uh, when I'm working with a group of researchers is to get them to really think about why they need to engage or why they think uh, the people that they wish to engage with want to engage. Um, and so that, that allows us to ask this question. So how do we know engaged practices are better? Um, and the we is in inverted commas because, of course, that may uh, involve academics. Uh, that may involve people who work beyond the university. So it's about being honest and open about the challenges of engagement um, and to make sure that there are really genuine reasons for doing this in the first place. So on the left hand side here, we have three boxes. Um, and these questions here, the normative, substantive and instrumental questions, um, come from the environmental management literature. Um, so the first time I saw these, I've seen come across these being published is around uh, the late uh, 1980s. Um, and they were asked, these questions were asked, say, particularly in relation to environmental decision making. So in that context, what should we do? Um, what's the best thing to be done? Uh, and what's in our best interests? And those questions were adapted um, for the engagement literature uh, in the early 2000s through some very influential uh, reports that were written uh, or published by the think tank Demos, um, written by academics, but published by um, Demos. Um, and what I've done here on the right hand side is just to, to adapt the questions for the context of engagement. So what it does is allows us to ask sort of sense check whether we think engagement is a good thing to do and, and who we might need to do it with. So I say it asks us under the normative one who should have access to research. Um, but crucially, how can we enable fairness in knowing? So that's in relation to the questions of epistemic justice that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so how can we in address questions of testimonial justice and hermeneutical injustice? Uh, sorry, justice, not injustice. Uh, under the substantive topic, uh, will the engaged practices improve the quality of research and all the impacts that are derived from that research? Um, and then say what forms of expertise and experience could be brought in to enhance the research. So there's, there's a, an assumption, I think, in the engagement literature, which is which is valid that academics don't know everything. Uh, that's not a great surprise to most people. But uh, again, academics do need to be reminded of that sometimes. So assuming that that is the case, who else can be brought into the conversation, into the engagement process that really improves the quality of the work? Uh, and the third one is uh, will engage research, uh, improve the chances of passing the PhD, getting a job, future funding. So it's very much more in the instrumental uh, approach. Um, and then from the other side of the, the equation is what will stakeholders, end users or members of the public gain? Um, and how will those different contributions be represented? So in, in, in relation to pretty much all the work I've done uh, in terms of engaged practices, the types of um, the types of ways that we represent that work uh, in an academic context through peer review publications and so on and so forth don't have any currency or very little currency beyond the academic context. In other words, how can we publish the work in different ways to allow different people to gain some, um, some reward or recognition for the type of, of work that's been done? So particularly when we work with schools, I did a lot of um, I did a lot of work to help support them in terms of offsped in inspections, for example, because that, that that's what they needed to get out of the work instrumentally. Uh, they were always very clear that they wanted the students to benefit in really obvious ways, uh, but they also had this secondary requirement, which was they have to do this uh, this audit uh, every so often. So that that was fine. I, I was happy to do that. I signed up to that from the start. But you get the idea, yeah? So people have different reasons to engage. And if we sense check these issues um, regularly throughout the engagement process and the way we plan for how we engage, 
um, then we should be in the right place um, and have people who are genuinely getting something out of this work. Okay, so one of the kind of key issues I found in relation to engagement, um, and it would be really interesting to see how this maps on to uh, practices of openness, is question of, of who is who is a public for research? Yeah, who should have a voice in research? Um, and I did some work with the, the paper up here at the top uh, by Anne Grand, myself, um, Gareth Davis, and Anne Adams. Uh, we we surveyed the type of issues that were that academics at the Open University were really struggling with in terms of engagement. And number one that came back to us was we don't know what a public is. Yeah, researchers were really struggling with this notion of what counts as a public for research. So what we did was we uh, we worked with uh, a couple of people in social sciences at the Open University at the time. Uh, Nick Mahoney is one of them and Hilda Stephenson is another. Uh, and they had explored, particularly in the political context, uh, the notion of what is a public. Uh, and they came in and did some really valuable work uh, for the Open University, which I, I have a bit of use to you as well, uh, around this notion of how do we create publics in meaningful ways. Uh, and this little pamphlet here, uh, the link is at the top there, uh, but the pamphlet here, uh, open access pamphlet, uh, explores three different approaches to creating a public. So Nick talks about representation, utility, and emergence. So effectively, uh, you can ask the question when you're trying to create a public for research, uh, and it's particularly useful if you're trying to plan research um, around these three questions. So you can ask the question, how do I create a public in three ways effectively? So you can do it through a representative approach where you look at sampling uh, or segmentation analysis. Um, so, for example, if you want to work with a particular demographic, um, then representation will be will be one way of doing it. Yeah, um, and it also allows you to then think about okay, who who is not represented in these debates? Yeah, who is routinely excluded, uh, and what do I need to do to ensure a that they get a voice, uh, but b that that voice is properly heard within the process? So there's a kind of representation question. Second one is very much around utility. Uh, so bringing in different forms of expertise and experience will really help in the work. Um, so I can imagine in the context of a, a, an open digital practice, then you might be working with uh, experts in design, for example, as well as uh, academic experts. So you can bring in theory, questions of theory and practice into the same conversation. Um, in relation to some of my own work, uh, as I say, this is uh, in required work with uh, science communication practitioners, for example, for, so anybody working from uh, a museum sector professional or science discovery sector professional uh, through to people who are working in, in forms of professional science communication. So what you're trying to do is to say who can really bring some expertise or experience which is of value to the research here. Um, it also allows us to think of questions of um, citizenship and volunteering in terms of whether people are doing this in a professional or a voluntary capacity. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, an issue about whether you've got everybody in the room who, who can contribute to the work. So that's a, that's a utility question. And the, the third one is, is to allow some forms of emergence to come through. So this is, this is around question is of whether you have built in the capacity for uh, self-organization, um, autonomy within the research allowing developing issues, particularly open in terms of open-ended or challenging questions that may go on over the time. And obviously new issues will emerge. So you may have people come in, you may have people drop out of the work. So that's just allowing people to to come in and to leave as they as they uh, as they need to within the work. And building in that into the process. So assuming that you're working with the, you know, within multiple research cycles, um, how do you allow people to come into the research for particular periods of time, but also to leave as well? So yeah, so that notion of how do we create a public, I think, is quite powerful. And I, I, I must say, I've seen it. I've seen it deployed in an engaged research context. Um, so it'd be useful um, to get a sense uh, at the end of the conversation about whether you think there is any value in that approach uh, for open research. Okay, so I thought I'd just give you a quick example of that in practice. 
Um, so this is the, the, the classic kind of citizen science approach. So obviously citizen science comes in various different forms. Um, so the question is, how do you design a citizen science initiative that allows you to create publics for particular purposes? Um, and whether that's been done in a kind of really meaningful way um, to really genuinely give people opportunities to engage. So um, the example at the top is, say, just of some, some open university uh, citizen science. Um, but the, the example of the book on the left hand side here, and this is a book that was written by a, a previous PhD student of mine called Vicky Curtis, um, and it's based on her PhD. And Vicky was really interested. She was interested in a lot of different aspects of citizen science. But the fundamental issue she was interested in was what, what brings people into these projects to start with, and crucially, what either makes them stay or leave. Um, and what she was trying to do was to get under the, the, the headline figures that you see for a lot of big citizen science projects, where you'll see people say, oh, we've got hundreds of thousands of registered users. So clearly, a lot of people were signing up to do these projects. But what she was really interested in was, OK, having signed up, how many people really stay and why do they stay? And how is the design process of the citizen science initiative either facilitated or not facilitated them staying? And what she found, one of the key found findings, uh, which I found fascinating, was that the reason people sign up for these projects is, is, is fairly obvious in that they want to make a contribution to science in some way. That's not that surprising. But the really nice thing that she found was that the reason people stayed was not because of the science, it was because of the social and community aspects of the work. So people were finding ways to work together, which they found really meaningful while they were contributing to the science. So the question then is, how do you develop that kind of hermeneutical capacity to, to develop um, a community of practice, uh, a self-organized community of practice? And she found one or two examples of these self-organizing communities of practice where people had come in, they'd learned how to use the, the citizen science initiative and contribute in ways that they found meaningful to them. But they also found all these additional functions that they found useful. Um, and what she found was that the small numbers of those uh, registered participants were then taking control uh, of the governance side of things and saying, actually, the scientists who had originally proposed the projects um, hadn't necessarily thought through, you know, who should own the project, who should own the community, uh, who should support the community. So they were taking on those forms of self-organization themselves and saying, well, actually, we, we find this valuable, but we want to co contribute in more than more ways than just developing new knowledge. What we want to do is provide a sustainable community. We want to provide a welcoming community, allow new people to come in, uh, which I thought was a really nice example of, of citizens taking control, basically, uh, in an emergent way. So that's, that's, that's one aspect of the work. Um, and I think that, that you know that those findings were quite surprising to the scientists themselves i don't think they expected that to happen um but it, it did happen and it was it was i say very useful i think to them to, th to then say okay how do we find ways to allow these people to actually just take control and keep control of these kind of initiatives um and the second example here is a specifically around building capacity so that we have a current phd project which is ongoing um, with um, a supervision team of myself, um, Jane Seal, who's an inclusive researcher uh, and a, 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 an old colleague and friend of mine um, called Eileen Scanlon, who I'm sure most of you have heard of uh, as an educational technologist. But what we were interested in uh, was exclusion specifically in relation to how capacity isn't allowed to be built in certain ways for, for particular communities uh, and how might we address that. Um, so um, the, the PhD candidate, Jess Carr, uh, who may be with us tonight, I can't see her on the system, but anyway, oh, yes, she, she is there. Hello, Jess, um, is, is working with a particular community um, of citizens with learning difficulties and seeing what capacity needs they have to allow them to genuinely take control of a research project, a citizen science research project. So they work collaboratively, they, um, 
they have distributed skills across the team, uh, different people bring different things to the team. And what she's trying to do is to explore mechanisms for really trying to promote genuine engagement within that community with a view to then sharing those findings more widely. Uh, so how might we take those findings from Jess's work uh, and allow it to support other citizen science projects uh, to genuinely become more inclusive? Okay, so a very practical um, application uh, of the theory of, of inclusion, I guess, is what I'm trying to point out there. And doing that through engaged practices, um, allowing people to have a voice in the research and to genuinely engage is is really at the heart of what I think Jess is trying to do. Okay, so that comes to uh, section four, which is very much around designing for diversity. Um, so how do we understand, personalize, uh, tailor, engage research design uh, for particular populations? So this very much comes out of um, some work that I'd done <clears throat> in a master's course, um, again, led by Eileen Scanlon, but with uh, with contributions from, uh, from a colleague of mine called Liz Whiteleg and Sam Schmidt, who were very much interested in, in design for all basically how do we how do we ensure that we design for all how do we ensure that we have inclusive methods of design and um, the question for me is having done that in an educational context is whether those kind of principles have transferred into the engagement community and particularly into how we plan for engagement um, and I've seen some really nice examples of that done uh, by people like Emily Dawson, based down at College London. Uh, she's thinking particularly about a museum's context. And um, um, but for me, it's about then saying, OK, how do we apply those kind of principles across all forms of research? And can we do that in ways which are, are really useful for, for those members of the public? Uh, so through the, the school's work, uh, I say particularly working with uh, teachers and students and researchers from across the Open University, we, we tried to come up, come up with some principles for engaged research design. Uh, and we settled on six, uh, and those six are here. Um, and this is very much from a kind of pragmatist philosophy. So how do we apply these principles in different ways, obviously, uh, will differ from uh, research project to research project. So, but the principles of, of thinking through these different uh, domains uh, or dimensions of research should allow us to, to have an engaged research design. Now, a lot of people say to me, well, you can't plan for engaged research um, because it becomes it's emergent as you go through. I disagree. I think you can plan for it as you would plan for any research project. But what you need to do is to be flexible and adaptable as you work through that project. So as you come across different challenges, uh, which won't necessarily be straightforward research challenges that we face on an everyday basis, uh, being able to adapt uh, in a principled way the way that we design to ensure that everyone has a voice within the research process. So given the discussion that I mentioned about creating publics, we won't be too surprised to see that people are at the center of this. So people really come down to the, the start of the process. Ensuring that we have the right people uh, in the room is really important. Um, then thinking about the purposes. Uh, so why are we engaging? So that, so that allows us to ask those questions that I mentioned earlier around the normative, substantive and uh, instrumental approaches. So why are we why are we trying to do this work in the first place and coming up with some sensible answers to that? Um, thinking about processes, so how do we want to work together? When do we want to work together? In what ways do we think we should work together? Uh, obviously very important in agreeing those. Um, and towards the bottom end, uh, if you look at the participation and performance, this allows us to, to introduce a, a culture of reflective practice, to, to think it, as we would do in any research project about what worked and what didn't work. Um, and then the other two dimensions are preparedness and politics. Uh, so preparedness is very much around the, the, the awareness of the possibilities uh, around engaged research um, and the politics is the inevitable politics of, of 
um, the funding landscape, where do we get resource to do this kind of work from, but is very much also taking into account the kind of localized politics, uh, and I mean localized and in inverted commas when you're thinking about different publics that you're working with. Uh, so as I've already mentioned, the schools context, um, I needed to take account of the Ofsted regime when I was doing that kind of planning with the school, uh, and the school were very active in the planning with me to ensure that we, we built that into the process. Um, so inevitably, I had the, the, the research audit culture in, in the background of my thinking uh, around the research excellent framework, and they had the, um, the teaching audit background in terms of schools around Ofsted. So we, we had to have that in the background because uh, that was those were both things that we knew we would have to take the work um, and evidence in those kind of contexts. Okay, um, so. If I take that into back into the school's context and just give a little example to illustrate how that works in practice, um, there is, a, a, say, a, an open access report which reports a lot of the work that we did in that context. Uh, and I'll give you a link to the to the worked example, the fully worked example of this uh, this example I'm just about to give you in a minute. But this uh, is. Again, we go back to our typology here, uh, rather than the creativity example which I gave you before. This is an inquiry example. So this is very much uh, an opportunity for the students to um, to really engage with cutting edge research. So that was that was the the specific project we were looking at was how do we bring authentic cutting edge research into the classroom? Um, and this work was led by uh, Vic Pearson at the OU, uh, who's a uh, I'm going to get this wrong now, but I, was th I always think of her as a geochemist, but she's going to tell me she's a physicist now and I'm going to get told off. But but anyway, um, Vic's been interested in, in questions of uh, inclusivity, inclusivity for a long time. She's also been interested in school university engagement for a long time. So she was an obvious person to lead this work. Uh, and she worked with the um, scientists who were working on the Rosetta mission. Uh, so the Rosetta mission was a, a small uh, spaceship that went off to try and land on a comet uh, and did so remarkably. Um, and one of the instruments on the lander that landed on the comet was called Ptolemy. Um, so the, the, the research scientists we were working with at the time uh, on this school activity were right at the heart at the time when we were doing this example, uh, this activity. They were, they were actually doing the, the live science on a comet uh, in the solar system. Uh, and they were remarkably generous with their time, I have to say, in doing this, um, given that context. Um, so what we did was we, we recruited a, a Denby science teacher, some educational technologists um, to work together with the Rosetta scientists to deliver a one hour physics lesson to 25 key stage five students. Uh, and it was a, a question of uh, developing that kind of activity uh, with these different forms of expertise over a period of time um, to then actually deliver it to the to the key stage five students. So uh, I'm just going to move on to the next slide. So what I wanted to do is just give you a, a little representation of the engaged research design. Um, so my, my experience of engagement is people tend to focus on the activity itself, less on the planning and preparation in terms of how we visualize things and the evaluation. Uh, so if you see here in this, this schematic, which was put together by my colleague, Gareth Davis, um, the actual lab pass, the actual activity in red is a tiny uh, part of a much bigger project of work. Um, and what we did at the start of this, in particularly in the in coloured in black, was all the engaged preparation. Yeah, so this is where that the actual collaboration takes place in terms of of how we planned for this. The engaged research design is very much in this uh, in the in the this side of the uh, the planning phase, if you like. Uh, and then in the the green, on this side, it was very much about data collection, uh, evaluation to assess the performance and the participation of different people in the activity. And what that allowed us to do was, was to collect together different forms of evidence that will work for us as researchers, um, as well as uh, different forms of evidence that will work for the school themselves. 
So we did that obviously deliberately to, if you like, over provide the amount of evidence that we required to ensure that everybody um, got what they required instrumentally from this activity, as well as ensuring that the, um, the uh, students got access to this cutting edge research. Uh, at the time when it was as, as live as it could have been in, in terms of the public sphere. Okay, so that's a little e example of, of how we take um, take those principles um, of designing for, for inclusivity uh, and apply them in practice. So, section five is, is, is the final section and it's very much about breaking down barriers. Um, I interrupt you. You've probably hello? got about five to seven minutes left. Okay, no worries. Okay, am I am I back in? I think I am. Okay, so section five, I say, is about breaking down barriers. So this for me is very much about uh, how do we break down barriers to inclusion? How do we break down barriers to genuinely promoting engaged ways of working? Uh, so it becomes uh, something which is, is more mainstream across um, an institution, for example. So um, this is a piece of work that I was involved in. I was a, a member of this working group of the STSC working group. Um, and what they were looking at is, the, is effectively the culture of engaged scholarly practices, particularly in the physical and engineering sciences. Um, and I say the report is online. You can have a look yourself. But what we came up with was a, um, a series of um, issues which needed attention. So while we generally found that um, engagement was valued, uh, the issues of having sufficient time, um, being creative sufficiently well, to evaluate effectively, to make sure that we had uh, secured funding for doing this kind of work, um, so it could then be recognized, so all these things are clearly linked, um, mm -hmm. Were, were very live yeah so these are still very live in the in the physical sciences community and i think they're still very live obviously in other communities as well and that comes partly down to institutional support it partly comes down to to funding so if we take one of those issues specifically was around planning so the the planning so this is a second report that we've just recently published around pathways to extensible engagement and what we found very much that the peer review system uh, in this area isn't working as well as it should. So the types of planning, assessment, monitoring and reporting are really not working as well as they could. However, they are all possible to solve. So the question is, how do we solve them? So most recently, some of the work I've been doing is around how do we build capacity and openness engagement through our, our new research plan at the Open University. And through the work I've been doing in our academic strategy offices, uh, we've explored five different areas that we can work in. One is a coordination. So that's about prioritizing resources and staff time. So that's addressed the issue of time, building capacity. That's partly about recruiting the right people, but it's also about training people and ensuring they have opportunities to do career and professional development. Um, and that's really important. I mean, a, typically a, an academic career, if we're lucky, goes on for 40 years. So CPD is, is part of what we do or should be part of what we do. If we do that well, it allows us to promote creativity. So that's partly about being aware of what's gone before um, and appreciating that in, in critical ways so that we can develop new ways of, of engaging. Uh, it's crucially, it's about capture. And that is a big issue, particularly in the UK at the minute. So how do we capture, curate and analyze evidence to promote this kind of work? Uh, and then finally, it's about that kind of issue of representation, which I've talked about, which is all about how do we communicate these uh, activities or the findings of these activities in ways that really work for different publics. OK, so final final couple of slides, which is just about reviewing. Um, so if you go back to the, the slide here uh, that I mentioned earlier, um, so this is just to say it's to review where we've come from. Um, I've taken the, the thinking of, of um, Martin and Eileen and Kate and added a little lens, which is the engagement lens, ask these questions on the left-hand side. Uh, on the right-hand side, we, we can see I'd say change is a huge issue here to how do we drive change in ways that are really meaningful uh, and allow us to reward excellence? How do we promote epistemic justice or fairness in knowing? 
uh, through this kind of work. That requires us to think, I think, carefully about motivations to engage. It makes us think carefully about engaged research design. Uh, and if we do this well, it really should drive uh, institutional change, which is, I say, a lot of what I've been trying to do over the last five or six years. So just to finish, uh, this leads us to the, uh, a, a piece of work which Martin uh, did in published in 2014, which is a book about the battle for opening, where he reflected particularly on, on the challenges of, of openness in, in the kind of higher education context uh, and how, as he says here, openness won and why it doesn't feel like a victory. Uh, and it, again, this really resonates with me because I can see challenges uh, in the engagement literature in, in the same way. Uh, so the imitation here being the most frustrating form of flattery. So the question really for me is, as, as we move forwards here, if we cannot create a kind of really progressive culture uh, for engaged practices, uh, will I end up writing a, a book similar to mine's, which is uh, how engaged research won and why it doesn't feel like a victory? Okay, so that's that's my uh, that's my slides. Uh, that's that's the talk. Um, if you have any questions, uh, far away. Um, I'll be on Twitter uh, today and tomorrow, later today and tomorrow. So if you want to post any questions there, I'm happy to try and answer them there as well. Excellent. Thank you very much, Rick. That was a really excellent talk. Um, I'm, going to, I'm happy to take questions from uh, the chat if anyone wants to put them. Uh, I'll kick off with one. Um, oh, yeah. Do you want to put your Twitter handle in the text? Oh, yeah. Science is underscore. I'll let you do it in a bit. Oh, so I was going to have one question to kind of kick it off, Rick. Um, and I guess I can, I can probably guess your answer for this, but I'll, I'll put it anyway. Um, how did you get around a kind of the slight dilemma, paradox, tension between engaging people with science and you know, making it open and popularizing it and making it and communicating it and not? oversimplifying it. I, I think there was a, I, I didn't read the report, I don't know how reliable it was, but I, I saw a feature on it in uh, the Times Higher last year about how people who popularise science, it means a lot of the public end up overestimating how much they understand it in a way. And so it's, it's almost damaging the way because people think they're, they, they think they're experts in certain subjects because they've seen you know, the, the BBC programme or, or read a, a kind of a piece about something and they don't really don't understand the complexities of it. And in some ways, it allows them to be overconfident about their opinions, and, it, uh, and often end up dismissing science. You know? So everyone's an, everyone's an expert suddenly you know, on Twitter and stuff. And so, um, yeah. so I wonder how you kind of get around if you've got any thoughts about how you kind of get around that that inherent dilemma between sort of popularising and engaging and being open and still making sure people understand, you know, a lot of the kind of real complexities and and problems around this kind of stuff. Yeah, that that is a <laughs> a big issue. Yeah, uh, and it, it it's it's a perennial challenge. I mean, it it will never go away. Um, I mean, if you think in the in the context of um, uh, just this new knowledge being published all the time, we we know a lot more than uh, when I started. You know, just generally in the sciences, uh, more is known about how uh, the natural world works. Uh, than we did than we knew 20 years ago yeah um, and that's that's just in my academic career so just just in the terms of 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 what a scientist might have known 20 years ago and what they know now has obviously changed dramatically uh, in certain areas more than others obviously so so you know there's not a kind of level playing field in that respect um i think um the the, the answer to the question is to be open and honest about where we think the boundaries of knowledge are in any particular area, um, to be uh, honest and open about the the uncertainties that we we know in you know in, in relation to any particular area, um, that doesn't mean that it's it's going to be a bed of roses in terms of how people respond to that. So if you think in the area of climate science, being an obvious example, uh, I think of somebody like Tamsin Edwards, who uh, recently worked at the OU and has gone to King's College London, who is utterly brilliant at this. You know, she, she's she's very straightforward and honest about what she knows. She's very straightforward and honest about the limitation of what she knows. She's very straightforward about the limitations in terms of what she might know in the future. Do you know what I mean? She's, she's, she's trying to be as authentic about the types of research challenges that she faces uh, as she can. 
and alongside that you have to have you know courage to do that in a, in a, in a contested area which i think she has um and you have to have persistence as well uh, and you have to have a pretty thick skin to be honest um to be able to do that so not obviously not where all areas of science are going to be that contested but you understand what i'm saying i mean these, these are not these are not easy issues to deal with um i think you know we will always have that challenge about uh dumbing down uh, is the reality um but if you put that in the context of as i think a really simple example uh where people had real concerns about dumbing down and, and what that actually might mean in practice um when they were switching on the Large Hadron Collider for the first time, there, there was a, a, a quite a bit of coverage in the media, uh, not just in the UK, around the world, that uh, switching on the Large Hadron Collider would create a back hole, uh, which, you know, pretty much everybody at CERN knew was ridiculous. Uh, however, I think there was also a kind of an acceptance that in, in allowing that hook to get out there, they would get a much bigger reach in terms of the the more sensible message they had to follow up, which was, okay, this is how we think the world works in terms of, uh, you know, fundamental particles. So in some cases, the dumbing down actually helped them in the longer term. Um, I don't think that always works, but you understand what I'm saying. These things are not one, there's not a one size fits all response to that. Yeah, I agree. Um, we've slightly overrun. So if anyone's got a question they want to ask, put it in the chat now, otherwise I'll, I'll end the, uh, the recording. I think it's interesting that there's a lot for me to go around and think about there. I noticed um, Tannis Morgan's in the session, and, and Tannis has done lots of work in terms of um, engaging audiences with open education and making sure different voices are included. I think there's probably yeah. quite a lot for us to think about in, 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 in terms of open education as well there. So thanks for that. Great talk, Rick. So I'm going to end the recording now. No worries.